All right, we're now into lesson two, the natural logarithm. In this lesson, you're finally going to learn what this irrational number E called Euler's number actually is, where it comes from, and what its uses are. And then the natural progression from that is to learn about the natural logarithm. So we're going to learn about ln x, and you'll learn what the base of that logarithm is, and you'll learn what the graph of that function looks like. So when you're ready to learn about Euler's number and the natural logarithm, head on over to jensenmath.ca so you can get a blank copy of the lesson. We are in the advanced functions course, and we are in the final unit, and this is lesson two, the natural logarithm. You can find a blank copy of the lesson here, and you can get practice problems by clicking on student worksheet, and after you're done the practice problems, you can click on worksheet solutions, and look through your solutions after. So when you're ready, let's get started. Okay, let's do part one. It's a bit of an investigation to figure out what Euler's number is. Let's discover what the irrational number E is, what its value is, and why its value is what it is. So the example we're going to go through involves an investment of $1, uh, at an interest rate of 100% interest annually, and we're going to vary the number of times that the interest is compounded throughout that year and see how that affects our initial investment of $1. So before we do this example, it would probably be beneficial for me to remind you about the compound interest formula that you learned about in the previous course. This is the compound interest formula. It has five variables where A is the future amount, P is the principal amount, which is the amount you invest at the beginning. That initial amount gets multiplied by 1 plus the interest rate, R, divided by the number of times that interest rate gets applied per time period, to the exponent of the number of times that interest rate gets applied per time period times the number of time periods. So this formula you should be familiar with, and we're going to use that for example 1. So let me just rewrite that formula right here. A equals the principal amount times 1 plus the interest rate, which we always use as a decimal value, divided by n, the number of times the interest is applied per time period, to the exponent of n times number of time periods. So for this example, it says, suppose you invest $1. Okay, that's our principal amount. That's why you see a 1 here at a 100% interest rate. 100% written as a decimal is one. That's why you see the rate of interest written as one. And we leave it in there for one year. Okay, so the number of time periods is just one. So that's why up here you just see n. n times one is just n. What is the highest amount of money you can have after one year as we vary the number of times the interest is compounded in that one year? So we're going to vary n. So as we vary n, how does that affect the future amount we're able to get our principal amount up to? So we'll use this version of the formula, which has our principal amount, our interest rate, and our number of time periods subbed into it already, to fill out this table with all these different compounding levels. So we're going to compound that interest a bunch of different amounts of times within that one year time period. So what if we only compound that interest once in the year, so at an annual compounding level? So in our formula, let me rewrite it at the top here. So if the compounding level is once a year, that means I'm only getting the interest once in that time period, so I would replace n with 1. So my future amount would be equal to 1 times 1 plus 1 over 1 to the power of 1. So that's 1 times 2 once that would equal $2. So after one year, my $1 initial investment is up to $2. It's doubled. Great. But what if I was able to compound that same interest rate, that same 100% interest rate, compound it semi-annually? So instead of getting 100% interest once a year, we'll get half of that amount, so 50% interest, twice a year. So plug in 2 in for n, and that formula will calculate what I just said. 
future amount would equal that $1 principal amount multiplied by 1 plus the interest rate divided by 2 because I'm now going to get the interest rate compounded semi-annually, so twice in a year. So that means I'm going to get the interest rate two times. So notice the interest rate is now cut in half, but I'm getting it paid twice as many times. So instead of 100% interest once, I'm getting 50% interest twice. If I evaluate this, I actually get $2.25. Why is it more? It sounds like it should be the same, 100% once or 50% twice. Why is this one more? Why is it beneficial to have a higher compounding level? Why is it beneficial to compound your interest more often? So let's think about this. That $1 is getting that, well, 1 plus a half, that's 1.5, right? It's getting multiplied by 1.5 two times and I told you yet that that's 2.25 but really what's happening is we're getting that 50% interest applied once and then to that amount we're getting another 50% interest applied so multiply that by another 1.5 and that's how we get to the two dollars and 25 cents the second time the interest is applied it's applied to the initial amount that already has interest applied on top of it so we're getting interest on top of interest. So that's why it ends up being more than just getting that 100% interest once. Because that 100% interest was all only applied to the initial amount. When we got the 50% interest twice, the first 50% interest was applied only to the initial amount, but the second 50% interest was applied to the initial amount plus that first amount of interest earned. So if getting the interest compounded two times in a year got us more than one time a year, then getting interest compounded quarterly four times in a year is going to make us even more. How much more? Let's figure that out. Let's plug in four for n. So a equals one times one plus one over four to the four. So instead of getting 100% interest once, we're now getting a quarter of that, so 25% interest four times. Let's see what that gets us. it gets me about $2.44. Notice I'm going to start writing a lot of decimal places here because what we're going to end up doing is we're gonna try and look for a trend in what these numbers are approaching. So the more decimal places we can keep, the better. And once we get to some of these higher values, as we start compounding the interest more and more times, up to a billion times, some calculators aren't going to be able to handle those high calculations. So I'm going to switch over to a high precision calculator online to make sure I'm getting accurate results for those. But you can just watch along as I calculate the future amount for these different compounding levels. So I'm going to keep compounding the interest more and more times. So we compounded that 100% interest once, then twice, then four times. Now we're going to do 12 times. So compound that 100% interest monthly. And then we're going to change it to compounding it 365 times in the year and then every second and then we're going to try and figure out what we would get to if we could compound that interest just continuously just all the time it being compounded so we're just going to choose a really huge number we'll choose a billion for that so watch as i fill out the rest of this table and fill it out as we go
All right, so I've filled them out, and I just kind of copy and paste it over from the high precision calculator to get these approximate values. So instead of writing them all out, just copy and paste it over. And what I want you to see is, yes, the more we compound the interest within that time period, yes, we do keep earning more money, but it starts to seem to be leveling off. So when we compounded daily, we got to $2.714567. We compounded instead of every day of the year, every second of the year, we got to 2.718. So, I mean, it's slightly more. We can see the difference once we look at the thousandths column, but it's not much more money, but yes, it is more. And if we compound instead of every second, if we did continuous compounding, so let's say a billion times in the year, we, we earn 2.718. One, okay, and this is where I can tell it's higher than the previous one. So it is still getting higher, but you know, at a very slow rate. So the number is leveling off. It seems to be approaching something. It's approaching this irrational number E. That number it's approaching, we call it Euler's number. And it's about 2.718281828459, blah, blah, blah. Keeps going. It's an irrational number. It cannot be expressed as a fraction just like pi. And this number has so many uses and it's so commonly used that it has its own button on a calculator that we can use its approximate value whenever we want. So like I said, this value of E, which we call Euler's number, is equal to the limit of what this compound interest is going to as the number of compounding periods within that time period goes to infinity. And we figured out it goes to about this 2.71828 irrational number. It's an irrational number, similar to pi. They're non-terminating, non-repeating, can't be expressed as fractions. And it turns out E is very useful when working with logarithms. We often use the base of the logarithm to be Euler's number E. And it's so commonly used as the base of the logarithm, we call it the natural logarithm when we use base E with a logarithm. And we can indicate that we have a natural logarithm, a logarithm base e, by writing ln of x. I think in Greek that stands for logarithm natural or something like that. But we pronounce this as ln of x. And when you see that, ln of x, we know that it's actually log base e of x. So ln is a logarithm with base e. Just like if you saw log of x, if you didn't see a base there, you would know it was 10. Well, same thing here. This is a logarithm. It's the natural logarithm, which has a base. Its base is just e. So if we were to evaluate, let's say, ln e, well, ln e is log base e of e. So what exponent goes on e to get e? The answer is 1. So ln of e is 1. So now that we've discovered what e is and what the natural logarithm is, Let's do some work with those and make sure you can find those buttons on your calculator and make use of their values. So you're going to need to remember all of these rules of logarithms. Since E is the base of the natural logarithm, we're going to be doing a lot of work with logarithms again. So make sure you remember these rules. So pause the video here, look at the rules, just quick reminder of them. Um, if you are adding logs that have the same base, you can write it as a single log with that same base with the arguments multiplied. Subtracting logs with the same base, write it as a single log with that same base with the arguments divided. Power law of logs, you can take the exponent of the argument down, write it as the coefficient of the log. Those are three of the main log rules. There's also change of base formula, and then a couple other reminders about how to transition between exponential and logarithmic expressions. So we'll use all of these rules for the rest of this lesson. So in part two, I just put this part of the lesson in here to make sure you can find the E and the ln button on your calculator. So if we want to do E cubed, remember E is that irrational number, that 2.71828 and so on number. So let's evaluate it. So we want to do E cubed, so find Euler's number on your calculator. It looks like a lowercase e, and we're going to do E cubed. So I'll round it to three decimal places, so about 20.086. So the approximate value of e cubed, 20.086. Ln of 10, 
So that means log base e of 10. So we're looking for what exponent can we put on e to get to 10. And our calculator can do that for us. If we want to do ln of 10, your calculator should have a natural logarithm button, this ln button right here. And we can do ln of 10. And notice, if you really understand logarithms, what your calculator is doing, it's checking what exponent can go on e to get 10. Let me prove that to you. If I do e to the power of that answer, what should I get? 10. It's solved for the exponent that goes on the base to get the argument. That's what logarithms do. So our approximate answer for ln 10 is 2.303, if I round to three decimal places. And ln e, well, what exponent goes on e to get e? Remember, ln means log base e. So log base e of e. What exponent goes on e to get e? 1. Let me prove that to you. Ln of e is, yes, it's 1. Okay, let's move on to example three, where we're going to solve some exponential equations. So when solving exponential equations, you're going to definitely need to remember how to transition between a logarithmic and an exponential expression. So if we had an exponential expression, y equals b to the power of x, we could write an equivalent expression in logarithmic form by writing x equals log base b of y. Those two expressions mean the exact same thing. The answer to this would be the exponent that goes on b to get y. So this equation tells us that x is the exponent that goes on b to get y. So b to the x equals y. And that's exactly what that says, b to the x equals y. So you need to know how to transition between those two expressions. So let's start over here. 20 equals 3 times e to the x. We want to solve for x, so I'll start by dividing the 3. 20 over 3 equals e to the x. And now I'm going to transition this into a logarithmic expression. I'm interested in what exponent goes on e to get 20 to the power of 3. So I could use a logarithm to ask me for that. Log base e of 20 over 3 equals x. This is just a way of asking your calculator what exponent goes on e to get that. And that's exactly what this equation wants. But you would never write log base e. Log base e, we have a notation for that. That's the natural logarithm. You could just write ln ln of 20 over 3 equals x. And then we can just evaluate this on the calculator to get an approximate value. Ln of 20 over 3, we get about 1.897. Now this is the way I would do this question. But you may want to use the power rule of logs to bring the exponent down. Yes, we could do that. Let me just show you another way we could do this. But I like this method the best. What we could have done, we could have done the same first step, divide the 3 over. And at this point, to get the exponent down, we could take log of both sides. And we could take log base anything of both sides. And in this case, it would be most advantageous to do log base e of both sides. So that means ln of both sides. So do ln of the left side equals ln of the right side. And once we do ln of both sides, you can bring the exponent down, write it as the coefficient of the log. So we have ln of 20 over 3 equals x times ln e. And what's ln e? Ln e, that means log base e of e, that's 1. So I have x times 1. So ln of 20 over 3 equals x times 1, which is just x. And this is the same thing we had when we did the question the other way. I just feel like this is a longer way of doing it, so I wouldn't do it this way. Once I was at this step, I would just use this rule and transition it to a logarithmic equation. Part b, since I have the power equal to a number already, I could transition it to logarithmic form right now. Oh, and I should mention to you, remember, some people get caught up in thinking this e is a variable. e is not a variable. This is a constant. It's that 2.71828 irrational number, Euler's number. We just have a symbol for it, just like pi. It's a number, not a variable. Our only variable here is x. So that's just a quick reminder about that. So if we're going to solve for x, let me transition this to logarithmic form. So right now I'm here. I want to change it to this. So the exponent is going to be the answer to the log. So 1 minus 2x equals. So I'm looking for what exponent can I put on e to get 55. So I can ask the calculator for that by doing log base e of 55. But you don't write log base e. That's the natural logarithm. So you just write 
ln. So 1 minus 2x equals ln 55. Now we just have to isolate the x. So let me just add the 2x to the right and subtract the ln 55 to the left. So I've got 1 minus ln 55 equals 2x. And now I'll divide the 2. 1 minus ln 55 over 2. That would be the exact value for x. Let me get an approximate value by typing that in. So I have to do 1 minus ln 55, and then I have to divide that whole thing by 2. So I'll evaluate that first, divide the answer by 2, I get about negative 1.504. And remember, we could check these answers, we could check it by plugging it back into the original equation, and it should work. Now, it'll be off by a little bit, the left side won't be exactly 55, because I have rounded this answer, but it should be pretty close. If I plugged in this exact value, it should work exactly. Let me try that. I get exactly 55. If I plug in the approximate value, I get really close to 55, but it's off by a bit because it was approximate. Let's do two more. These ones are logarithmic equations. My variable is in the argument of a logarithm for both of them. So when I solve these ones, let me start by isolating the logarithmic expression. So let's isolate this ln of x minus 3. Remember, ln is a logarithm. It's the natural logarithm. So I'll add the 7 over. So I have 2 ln x minus 3 equals 10. Now I'll divide the 2, ln of x minus 3 equals 5. And once I'm at this stage of the question, remember this ln is actually, and you wouldn't actually write this, but it's actually log base e. And I'm just showing you that because now we can transition this logarithmic expression back this way into an exponential expression. The base of the log to that exponent equals the argument. Over here, the base of the log to that exponent equals the argument. e to the power of 5 equals x minus 3. And then we can evaluate for x just by adding the 3 to the other side. x is equal to e to the power of 5 plus 3. That's the exact answer for x. I can get an approximate answer by typing that in. I get 151.413, approximately. And don't forget, we could check this answer by summing it back into the original equation. And actually, when we solve a logarithmic equation, we have to check the answer because there is the possibility of us getting an extraneous root. Now, I know for this one, this is going to be an actual answer. The only time it wouldn't be an actual answer is if when you sub it back in, it makes the logarithmic expression undefined. And it would only be undefined if it makes the argument zero or a number less than zero. But clearly, if I plug 151 in for x, I get a positive argument, so I know that this function exists for that. But I should also check and make sure it makes left side equal to right side. So this is the left side of the equation, and the right side of the equation is 3, so this should equal 3, and it does, so we have the correct answer. If it was an extraneous root, it would have made this be undefined by making the argument be 0 or negative. Okay, part D, I can think of a couple ways to do this. Um, maybe I'll show you both ways. The first way is probably the way you would think to do it because it's how we normally solve logarithmic equations. I could start by transitioning this into an equivalent equation but in exponential form. The base of the log, e, to the power of 2 would equal the argument. So e squared equals 4 e to the x. And now I'm interested in isolating x, so I'll divide the 4 over, e squared over 4. Remember this e squared over 4, well e is just a number, it's an irrational number, so e squared over 4 is just a number. Um, if I want to solve this equation for x, well the x is in the exponent, so this is an exponential equation I need to solve now. So I should transition this back into logarithmic form. So log base e of this number would equal x. But you wouldn't write log base e, that's just the natural logarithm, you would write ln. And this is the exact answer, I could evaluate that. x is approximately equal to 0 0.614. Now I told you I'd show you another way, um, sure, let me show you another way we could get to that same answer. So just for fun, I could use the product rule of logarithms, so I could split this into ln of 4 plus ln of e to the x. So that's the product rule of logs. And now I could use the power rule of logs to bring this down. So I have ln 4 plus x ln e equals 2. And ln e is just 1. 
So all I have right now is ln 4 plus x equals 2. So x would equal 2 minus ln of 4. Let's see what I get when I do 2 minus ln of 4. I get the same answer. They're equivalent to each other. So it wouldn't matter which of those we did. Either are fine. All right, part three, we're going to graph e to the x and ln x. Let's start by graphing e to the x. So when we graph an exponential function, I know exponential functions all have horizontal asymptotes at y equals zero, unless they've been shifted up or down, of course, but e to the x is not, so it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Now, to get a good shape of the graph, I normally say choose x values of negative one, zero, one. We'll plug those into the exponential function and get the y values. So we'll do e to the negative one, e to the power of zero, and e to the one. And we'll get just a couple decimal places for each of these because that'll be enough to do a fairly accurate graph. So we'll do e to the power of negative one first, and I get about 0 0.37 e to the power of 0, well, anything to the 0 is 1, and e to the power of 1, well, remember, e is that irrational number, 2.71828, so on. So let's round to two decimal places. It's about 2.72. So let's graph this function. Let's draw our horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And then let's plot our points. Negative 1 was at about 0.37. When x was 0, it was at 1. And then when x is 1, it was at about 2.72. So it was around here. And then the function is going to look something like this, where it's never going to cross this horizontal asymptote. It's going to just get closer and closer and closer to it as x goes to negative infinity. So this is the e to the x function. Let's also graph ln x on the same grid. Now, when we graph logarithmic functions, Normally we choose y values, negative one, zero, and one. And after we choose the y values, we calculate the x values by doing the base of the log to the power of y equals the argument, because that's how logs work. So to get the x value that goes with the y value of negative one, I would do e to the negative one gets me x. Well, that's exactly what I did over here to get the y. So it's going to be 0.37. In fact, these functions are inverses of each other. So you're going to notice the x's and y values are just swapped. So this one was negative 1, 0.37. This one's going to be 0.37, negative 1. So this was 0, 1. This is going to be 1, 0. Right? If I plug 0 in for y, do e to the power of 0, and I get 1. So x is 1. Plug 1 in for y, e to the power of 1 is about 2.72. Notice the x's and y's are all just swapped from these ones because these are inverse functions. Do you remember how to find inverse functions? Let me just prove to you they're inverses of each other. Let's find the inverse of y equals e to the x. Well, the inverse functions have x and y swapped, so algebraically we swap the x and y, and then we isolate the y. So I would rewrite this in logarithmic form. So log of that base with that argument would equal that exponent. So log base e of x equals y and log base e, that's just ln. So the inverse of e to the x is ln x. That's why the x and y coordinates are just swaps of each other. So instead of a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, there's going to be a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So let's plot these points and that vertical asymptote and see what ln x looks like. All right, so there's the ln x function. It's going to approach that vertical asymptote as x gets closer to zero from the right of zero. And it takes that shape right there. And notice these functions are diagonal reflections across that diagonal line y equals x because they're inverse functions. Inverse functions always have that property. All right, so hopefully now by the end of this lesson, you know what e is, you know Euler's number, you know what the natural logarithm is, and you know what their graphs look like and you can comfortably solve exponential and logarithmic equations that have E involved in it. All right, that's it.